in a conversation about the challenges because um, uh, supporting children's rights in a digital world is a real challenge. So um, I don't know how well you can see my screen but I, I have a, a Google alert every day for child and internet and every day I get bad news. Um, and the news is horrifying. Um, sometimes it's about terrible things that the internet does with children. Sometimes it's about um, the anxieties that everyone has because anxieties are very high about um, children's access to the digital world. And sometimes the news is also about the arguments being held, especially among policymakers. Um, including uh, the European Commission, about how to make um, children, to ensure that children's access to the internet is better managed and um, protected. I think for many people, there is a real fear that, um, as one influential uh, American psychologist has said, smartphones have destroyed the generation. Um, she said this uh, now. Um, a few years ago, and she said it again recently, and many have said this. The, the sense that technology is so bad for children uh, that they should be kept away. Um, the graph is the kind of data that, in fact, I and my colleagues would critique, but I think we must also engage with. So the graph suggests that children, in this case, children's loneliness was uh, improving over time in recent years until the invention of the smartphone and then it got worse. And there are many graphs about concerned with children's mental health that suggest technology is the cause. I would like to suggest um, that many things in the last 15 years, in addition to um, the advent of the smartphone, social media, um, and, and technological innovation. We could also point to a financial crash worldwide. We could also point to increased academic pressures on children. We could also ask questions about uh, the direction of causality. Perhaps because they are under stress and children are struggling with the challenges of the world, there are many questions we could ask. My point really is to say, in about children and their rights in the digital world, we have to take into account many, many factors. But we can have a subtle view, we can recognize a multi, there are many factors that matter in children's lives, but sometimes the policy arguments are also very And I show you here, um, this is some news from Britain um, as we have tried to pass a regulation, just in fact succeeded in a regulation called the online 
And as you can see, the critical press is very critical. Um, can we, if we're going to keep children safe online, we must make the whole digital world um, a child, a child space. Everyone will be treated like children. This is um, uh, an evidently negative um, vision. Uh, and even though this is too stark as well, I'm beginning with the, um, the strong uh, claims, um, there are some grounds for anxiety about how policy can be put in practice in a way that respects everyone's rights, including um, children's and, and adults. Uh, the joke on the uh, right, I have seen all, um, uh, all my, th um, through all my research days, people say they want to protect children, but actually they are looking to increase the sphere of the state. So over the years that I've been doing my um, research, and over the years that we have been having these debates, the internet itself has changed. So um, uh, this is my last joke, uh, by the way. <laughs> You'll have to tell the jokes um, after this. Um, over the years that we've been doing this work, at the beginning, there was a very serious challenge that uh, as the joke has, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. I think this was meant to be a good news story. On the internet, you can enjoy anonymity, privacy. You can do whatever you like. The, the government can't um, uh, come after you. Um, you're, you can enjoy playing with identity. There were many positives. Now, I think we have changed our mind in some ways. Now we see that um, if no one knows who anyone is, if no one knows you're a dog, also no one knows if you're a child, or no one knows if you need help, or no one knows um, what kind of provision might be appropriate to your needs. And for me, um, and many who work with children's um, rights, it's a real problem that we don't know. How, how do you protect children's rights if you don't know who's a child online? And there are many offline parallels that are worth thinking about. When um, a child is in the street, outside, even, everyone knows they're a child. Nobody has checked their age, nobody has invaded their privacy, but people know. And they just you know, help them up if they fall over, um, stop them if they're trying to buy alcohol, um, watch out for them when they're crossing a busy road. You know, we, we do these things every day without it feeling invasive or intrusive. But when we try to do it online, it feels invasive and intrusive. And so the right-hand part of the story is that sense that the internet is now far from anonymous. It's become a space where everything is known about us. Everything is tracked. Everything could be used to benefit us or used against us. Um, and the anxiety among many is that this lack of privacy and spread of surveillance has in itself become a danger. So the question I have for you today is whether we can find ways to know who is a child online and protect and embed and support their rights without increasing the surveillance state and the, um, the incredible uh, level of commercial, um, let's say, pressure, perhaps, um, exploitation that goes along with tracking every single thing we do online. So that's the puzzle that I wake up with um, each morning. So I summarize it as saying, in the beginning, we didn't know who was a child, children were invisible. That led to lots of problems. We assume that everyone is an adult online. I think often those producing um, digital services make the assumption everyone is adult, everyone is healthy, perhaps everyone lives in a wealthy country, everyone is um, um, able to deal with what happens. Um, now children are no longer invisible, they are hyper-visible, and they are targeted and they are um, tracked in ways that is a different kind of a challenge. 
So in my work um, as a, um, a university um, professor and uh, as a researcher, I always try to um, ground my work in the everyday experiences of children and the everyday uh, needs and interests and voices of children. And so I, I like to have a, a set of images that just reminds me children live real lives, their lives are as different from each other as our lives are, and adult lives are different from each other. They're not a single homogenous category. But of course they are undergoing, they're living through a time of incredible change. Um, they are living through a time of considerable pressure and the social statisticians are noting a whole series of difficulties that children um, are facing in their, um, in their lives, including a mental health crisis, um, including um, incredible anxiety about the future of the planet, um, and including a sense that the digital is their space, the thing that they understand better than us and that they want to have a voice in um, more than us. So that sense of the future, the future they think absolutely is, is theirs. So, um, uh, uh, as, as was mentioned, I've spent the last, um, let me just think, nearly 20 years uh, uh, working with a network of researchers called EU Kids Online, where we have a team of researchers in each uh, country now, about 33 countries in what I will call uh, the continent of Europe rather than necessarily um, the European Commission, um, but of course also. Um, originally, the project was set up by the European Commission, who felt this is a, a crucial moment to establish um, digital policies and digital literacy initiatives and digital safety initiatives for children. And we need to know the research in every country. So we have a team in France, but also a team in um, um, Portugal and Croatia and Latvia and, and many uh, uh, across, across Europe. Um, I've put up our report and there are many differences across countries and this is another struggle because especially um, uh, here there is, there is policy at the national level, perhaps even at the local level, there is policy and regulation at the uh, European level and of course there is also international um, uh, policy and regulation. And I'm going to talk in a minute about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child as a kind of um, uh, umbrella um, framework for, for um, the work. Um, but focusing in on Europe, actually what we have often found is incredible, um, even though different countries get online at different times and they have, of course, their own cultures of um, education, of parenting, um, of risk, of kind of moral um, framing, but nonetheless we also see some, um, some common um, patterns. So I could tell you that in the, in the recent years, um, about 10% of children across Europe said they never feel safe online, and most feel they say they sometimes feel unsafe online. Um, and they then talk about a whole range of risks, of content, of cyberbullying and other kinds of conduct. Um, uh, they and their parents are now increasingly anxious about being approached by strangers online. Um, there's a lot of concern about the commercial environment of the internet. And actually, I think it is fascinating that in the last uh, 20 years, we have kind of moved our societies from a public and informal space of the home, the school, the street, all has gone online, so all has been moved onto a commercial um, infrastructure. Uh, and children's everyday communication, our family communication, our school infrastructure, um, our how people go about their lives has all been moved onto a commercial digital infrastructure which is driven by attention, driven by advertising, driven by profit. So it's actually an extraordinary shift that we are, that we are living through. In um, um, 
more recent years, the last um, eight years, I've been working with UNICEF to take this model to think about um, global kids online. Uh, and this, I, I think, I have to say is um, audacious um, because it's um, an incredible challenge to try to uh, study children across the world. Um, they, they number in their billions. Um, but what we did was we took a kind of model of research tools and invited researchers and policymakers in different countries to join and um, have some uh, similar methods and therefore comparable findings. Uh, and the idea is to try to understand how this global technology is affecting children um, in so many um, different parts of the world. And you'll see there that once I began working with UNICEF especially, we began framing the research in terms of children's rights. And um, for me, it's a very um, powerful framing that uh, adds uh, an imperative uh, to the research. I can, I can track the risks and the opportunities that children encounter online. But the child rights framing gives us the imperative for change. Because of this, we must do something because children's rights, um, every state in the world except the United States um, has committed uh, to um, uh, respecting, protecting, and fulfilling children's rights, including um, online. What I find in the, in the policy space, when I, when, as an as a academic, when I leave the university and I talk in different policy environments, I find two, still, two very separate conversations. So one conversation is about what we can think of as the opportunities. And here are some of our statistics summarized, um, giving you the opportunities that children find online. Um, and there the conversation is about um, what do children do in different countries? But also, what do we want them to do? So we were having a discussion about news um, earlier and whether children should see the news. Um, in our survey, these children are between 9 and 17 years old. Um, and you can see that I looked for news online is not a very common activity. We might say today, this is good because the news is pretty scary and pretty horrifying for children. But we might say it's a problem because children are young citizens. They will um, soon get the vote. They have the right to participate and to engage in the world as citizens with their own beliefs. And maybe this is a problem. Maybe this is where we have the evidence to say something further should be done. What, what lies behind these figures that I can't show you um, here is the inequalities. Over and again, more privileged children, children from wealthier homes, children living in wealthier countries very often um, get to do uh, more of the opportunities, which after all is why we gave them access to the internet in the first place, right? We said this is the wonderful place to connect, to get, have the world at your fingertips, to get all the information you could ever want to explore. Now I think when we suggest children could be free to explore online, we get worried about all the risks. And the evidence of the risks we've also been tracking, and the risks are many, um, as I've already noted. You can see here, in many countries, children are seeing hate. The internet is becoming, in many ways, a hateful space. They are seeing sexual content about which we could have a discussion about whether this is a problem and in what way. They're seeing violence. They're seeing um, self-harm and suicide content. Um, also um, in, in growing numbers. And in fact, in Europe, we see these as the areas of growth in the last decade, more exposure to hate, more exposure to self-harm and um, suicide-related um, content. My struggle sometimes is that when I'm in the space talking about the evidence for opportunities, Everyone is saying, yes, we need more technology in the classroom. We need to encourage parents to um, uh, go online with their children to develop their digital literacy. We want children to benefit from these opportunities. And then when I'm in the conversations about risk of harm, 
it's how can we restrict, how can we make parents into a barrier between their child and the content, how can we keep children uh, away from the technology and safer. And for me, a child rights approach is the way of bringing these conversations together because they're the same children um, and the same parents and um, we need a way of both maximizing the opportunities and minimizing the risks. So, um, uh, just another reminder of uh, <laughs> children's everyday lives. It is very hard for, um, uh, my, my last book was about um, digital parenting. Uh, it's very hard for parents who are being told, give your child the access to technology, it's the way ahead, it's the future. But don't let your children touch the technology, it's rotting their brains and undermining their mental, I mean, the, the messages in the public discourse are often very confused and very polarized. Meanwhile, children are getting on with it and working out their own strategies and their own digital literacy. So a child rights approach is always holistic. This is um, UNICEF's summary of the rights of the child. Um, and it just reminds us there are 41 substantive rights in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which France and everywhere else has ratified, which means promised to incorporate into French law and French practice and policy, and the same um, for, for other countries. And so in the last five years, I've been uh, thinking hard about what that means. What does the right to privacy, in principle, mean online? What does the right to children's expression, the right to expression mean online? Does it mean they have the right to go on social media when they're five years old? What does the right to um, uh, play mean when online there are both fantastic games and play opportunities, but also huge anxieties about the violence of, of online games or the addictive properties of online games? So in the um, last few years, I worked with the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, along with um, uh, a team of um, experts and advisors, um, and hosted by the Five Rights Foundation, which is a, um, a charity um, advocating for children's rights in, in Britain. Um, and we work to write what um, the um, UN calls a general comment, a statement, an authoritative statement of how to translate children's rights. We work to debate um, and deliberate with um, experts internationally and with children um, around the world on how to understand their rights in digital contexts. And one of the key principles of the Convention on the Rights of the Child is that one always um, uh, pays attention to the voice of the child and their understanding of their rights and their understanding of those key issues of, um, uh, of privacy, of safety, of play, of um, participation um, and, and so forth. So children had much to say, experts had much to say, but they don't all agree. And I think we have to say that in moving forward, we are in a contested space. And that's why I'm going to stop talking in a moment and, um, and, and hear your, um, your views on how to kind of navigate this contested space. One problem that I have found um, is, is that child rights advocates know many things about how the world is and should be for children, but they don't necessarily know very much about the design of the digital environment. And those who build the digital environment and make the digital products and services don't always know very much about children or child rights. And so now I found myself in another space where two conversations need to be brought together. I think this is my lens for my um, work. Um, always guided by the voice of children. And here you can see many of the um, concerns that children express around the world about how the digital environment um, is regulated and is designed. So I'm going to, so of the many directions that I could now uh, take this debate, I want to focus in my last um, couple of minutes on the challenge of designing digital products and services. Um, 
because one of the things that the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also the general comment 25 on, on child rights in a digital context says, is that states must work with businesses. States have the obligation to enact and fulfill the convention, but um, businesses have a responsibility under UN um, regulation and often under national law as well. But how the state works with the business and how the businesses then um, interpret the requirements in all of the different kinds of things that they do from designing cloud infrastructure to ed tech to games that children might use to the literal design of the device. I've got so many devices here, I'm <laughs> getting tangled in the, um, the multiplicity. Um, and it's not the business is a neutral space, as I've always already said. So I think there are many ways in which we could see that business itself has designed the digital environment in ways that are hostile to children's rights. Um, I'm sure people noticed Frances Haugen's revelations a couple of years ago when she was the whistleblower at Facebook, now um, Meta, um, and came out and said, Facebook, Instagram knows perfectly well it is damaging the mental health of our young people through its practices, through its design, through its algorithms that push young people in, or children in directions that are ever more extreme, ever more um, risky. Um, the Child Rights Foundation that I'm working with um, did a, a, a brilliant report on showing how young people are kind of pushed down pathways they kind of begin under their own control, choosing where to go. But the design, the algorithms, the uses of data take them in a direction which is directed more by profit than it is by um, child rights. So there is a pushback movement and increasingly people are focusing on the idea of design and by design solutions. Um, not waiting until the product has hit the market and is being used and then discover, oh surprise, that there are problems for children, but trying to think about, anticipate those problems in advance, trying to change the business model and the business practice and the design process so that children's rights are anticipated from the start. Whether it can work is kind of up to all of us. Um, whether it's going to be successful. There are now very strong movements for security by design, um, to build security. And I think we all know that when we buy a new device or access a new website, it already comes with the security inbuilt. It doesn't wait. Well, actually, many things go wrong, so I won't overstate the case. Um, privacy by design and safety by design are getting more attention. But this is, these are vital, but they deal with the, um, the um, they stop the bad things. They don't have that holistic vision of all the positives that we wanted for children. So we also need by design solutions for play online, for participation online, for education online, for ways of recognizing children's positive um, rights. And my kind of last, my, my, my final points for now really are to say that I've been working um, leading a project called the Digital Futures Commission over the last um, three or four years in which we've been trying to ask what does good look like because there's so much focus on what what is bad what is wrong but it's remarkably hard I think to visualize what do we really want for children with the riches and resources of the digital um, uh, age because we're not going backwards. And as I said, we have really um, consulted children. Um, all, all child rights projects um, are, uh, learn a lot from consulting children. Um, and we had a lot of fun asking children to write to the CEO of Google or whoever, okay, what do you want them to do? What, you know, we, we workshopped it, we talked about possibilities, we um, engaged with them. Um, we ask them about their rights. They have the right to their fullest development, um, Article 29 in the Convention. What does that look like for them 
in a digital world? What did they have to say? What did they want from the services that they use? And what would, what do they, would they find empowering? We also talked a lot to designers. And um, that was an interesting challenge and a new experience for me to talk to the, interview the people who design and develop products and services used by children. Um, and to understand what is their kind of process of development, to find the right moment in the organization, to find the right moment in their work when they can um, stop and think, but what if children are using my service? What do children need? Have I thought about their education, but also their privacy and also their safety and also their um, civic rights and freedoms? How, how do I think about that? And I have to say, designers and developers have their own challenges, um, and they're, oh, they're embedded in their own power structures, of course. So this is not easy either. Um, I don't know how much the um, uh, design uh, double diamond is used in France. In Britain, the Design Council kind of developed this model of what the design process looks like. Um, and so we have thought carefully about when, a, when the um, product manager is in the discovery phase, what shall I build? They have one set of questions, a one moment of thinking about child rights. When they're defining the product, okay, we're going to build this, this is what its features will be. Um, they ha you know, there's another moment. When they're trying out all the solutions, discovering the difficulties, discovering is another moment. And then when they deliver, it's a final moment. Of course, what, what product managers told us is all of these things happen at once and it's much more iterative and agile and complicated. But broadly, um, there are moments when um, they can think of design. And so um, my last slide is to offer you the idea of child rights by design, which brings it all together. Um, I don't know if you can see, it says child rights by design at digitalfuturescommission.org.uk. So this is a microsite and it has everything I've just said and more. It has resources for designers. It has um, a rationale that with which they can go to the CEO of their company and say, this matters, I need resources because. Um, but most importantly, it offers um, 11 principles which is um, uh, a kind of a translation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child with its 41 articles into 11 principles that I think could be put on the wall of the design studio or kept on the um, um, office wall. So the first principle is equity and diversity and it groups together a number of children's rights and it invites designers. They said, don't tell us what to do. You don't know our world, you don't understand our business, but give us questions to think about, provoke us to, to, to think anew. So we said, okay, so how, how have they thought about equity and diversity? How have they anticipated different kinds of children who might be among their users? What provision can they make for the children who have particular needs, who are less um, privileged? Best interests, principle number two, is a really um, crucial um, article in the UN Convention, and it's, if you like, the balancing principle. How can you think about children's interests holistically, recognizing the full array of their needs? What have you thought about that? Can you document your thinking? Can you document the challenges to that? Um, consultation, have you consulted children in, in developing your product or service? It's amazing to me how many people postpone that moment or they consult children about whether they'd like it to be red or blue, but not about whether they'd like it to take their data or connect them with strangers. Um, age appropriate, we were just talking about that um, earlier as well. How can we make products and services um, age appropriate? A five-year-old needs something different than an 11-year-old, something different again than a 16-year-old. But a 16-year-old who is a refugee living in trouble might need more protections than, a, 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 but they might also need more opportunities. They might need more help, better information. So how can we be appropriate to the age of different children? 
We, we, we added um, one on responsible, um, which means have you taken account of the, the guidance available, the laws and regulation available? Because we, did a, we looked at lots of companies' websites um, and they all, after 2016, said they were GDPR compliant um, and um, with a general data protection regulation, but not much more. It was as if um, companies aren't really quite sure what to declare compliance with, where to turn for um, guidance. Participation is crucial. Does your service support and enable children's participation? Does it um, ensure their privacy? And by privacy, we mean not only privacy from strangers, but also maybe privacy from peers, maybe privacy from parents, that's a controversial one, maybe privacy from companies who would collect all their data. There's an advertisement from Facebook, as was, which says, if you tick all these boxes, um, I don't want my family to see, I don't want my friends to see, I don't want strangers to see, then you'll be private. To me, this is a, a lie to children, because you will be private from everyone except Facebook, who will sell your data through um, the data brokers to um, everyone who might want to pay for it. Okay, safety, I think we can kind of um, understand why that's important. Um, but as I said, those developing um, educational products don't always think about safety, just as those developing safety products don't always think about privacy. Um, Well-being, children's development, by development we include the importance of play. And agency... Um, we've put last but definitely not least and by agency we mean the child's right as a rights holder the child's position as a rights holder as an agent not to be pushed about by the different um, algorithms not to be um, always persuaded just a little more play a little longer watch another advert um, see the next video but to have the the headspace to make up their own um, decisions all right, I have definitely talked longer than I had wanted, so I'm going to stop with one slide that says the European Commission is now debating a code that in a way would do much of this. Um, and they want everyone's input and advice because they have some real challenges. Um, I've told you what I think my advice to them is. Um, you will have other experiences to contribute but I hope I've signaled along the way that this is not going to be um, easy. And I look forward to your thoughts and questions. Thank you very much. C'est bon? Vous m'entendez bien? <rire> euh, je vais juste commencer avec une, une petite question euh, qui fera la transition et puis je vous donnerai la parole parce que j'imagine que vous avez des questions aussi euh, moi je, je, on voit bien hein, que, que ce travail de, de design qui s'intéresse donc spécifiquement euh, aux droits des enfants euh, est plutôt un, un travail euh, qui s'adresse à ceux qui réalisent les services numériques et au fond, euh, moi, je m'interroge si finalement la cible, c'est les ingénieurs, c'est les business developers, c'est les politiques. Finalement, à qui on s'adresse quand on fait un, un livrable comme celui-là um, Good question. I, I think really, um, child rights by design is for everybody. But I really um, want to... We wanted to start with the producers, designers, the product managers, um, because, ah, so, because they are um, uh, often not part of the conversation and their particular constraints and requirements. You know, we, we debate a law. Um, we will have a law that says children should not access pornography, for example. We don't always ask ourselves, what does that mean that the um, product managers must do? Must they have moderation? Must they put in age verification? Must they um, uh, have filters? You know, so, so in a way, I wanted to put the practical layer between the policymakers and the um, public expectations. But I think it's a, maybe it's also a language that policymakers can use and that um, uh, the public could use to call for children's agency. 
children's privacy, children's right to participation, and so forth. Alors, cette fois-ci, je me tourne vers la salle. Euh, Est-ce qu'il y a des questions à ce stade J'espère qu'il y en a. Oui, il y en a une. Alors, je, je vais vous amener le micro. Oh, um, thank you so much, uh, Sonia. Thank you so much, Dory, uh, <laughs> for a so relevant uh, and so cool uh, conference and masterclass. Uh, as I talked to you uh, before the conference, I just want to uh, say one word because uh, we are launching in my association an hashtag today and I talk about that. Uh, what is my association? I am Patrice and my association is EDUC++. Uh, it's a pro je vais le dire en français. Uh, donc en fait, c'est le, le projet d'éducation au bon numérique et plus de maîtrise des écrans. Donc on travaille avec plein de gens dans l'esprit euh, que porte euh, en permanence Dory et que vous portez aussi. Et donc euh, la, le hashtag c'est très simple, euh, il date de, depuis une semaine. C'est-à-dire depuis euh, l'affaire de, de l'Israël et de la bande de Gaza et, et depuis l'affaire de l'assassinat du professeur de français. Euh, on s'est rendu compte avec d'autres personnes, je pense à Serge Tisseron, qui est un grand psychiatre, qui vient d'écrire une tribune dans un magazine qui s'appelle La Vie, un magazine catholique, avec Maria Marion Aza, qui a énormément travaillé sur la parentalité. Et en fait, le massacre que je vais proposer simplement, c'est euh, pas les infos devant les enfants. Et on va essayer de toucher, et vous êtes des conseillers numériques, vous êtes des gens dans le numérique, vous avez affaire à des départements, à des régions, tout ce que vous voulez. Et en fait, ce serait très intéressant qu'on arrive aux oreilles des parents, en particulier les parents invisibles, ceux qui ne s'occupent jamais de venir nous contacter quand on a l'occasion de leur parler, éteignez la télé pendant les infos. Et éteignez la radio pendant les infos. Parce que c'est très important. Je te passe la parole après. Ben voilà, la question c'est toi. C'est-à-dire, en fait, là, le hashtag, c'est donc on va promouvoir aujourd'hui le lancement de ce hashtag. Hein. Euh, euh, Not the news in front of the children. And uh, la question c'est wha qu'est-ce que uh, what do you think about uh, this uh, uh, th uh, the way to think and uh, about the, the the rule of the little association like mine, uh, just to 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 touch the the parents. But this is my question. Um, so I, th I so thank you, um, and I think it's. Uh, I think we should first acknowledge this is a terrible time in the news for everybody. Um, and everyone is thinking um, how to um, know what is happening, as is their civic duty, while also um, perhaps protecting themselves from truly terrible images. And everyone is asking, what, what is my duty? What, do, what should I see? So my suggestion would be, um, so I understand the impulse, but my suggestion is that um, children according to their age and maturity, are also asking themselves this question. And our challenge as parents and as teachers and as a society is to find the way of protecting, let's say, the five-year-old, but bringing the 15-year-old into the conversation. And somewhere in, in between five and 15 is the difficult time, right? And it's a big, it's a big time. So... If we were taking a whole society solution, we would want to say, first, where is the children's news? The news made for children. And perhaps your public service television does this. In, in many, especially large countries with a public service tradition, there is news for children. And it will inform the children without terrifying the children. Um, so I think... Um, then we want the guidance for parents that recognizes that parents and children are very different. Older children, watch with them, perhaps. Um, maybe watch before and then watch with them and talk about it, because the worst thing for children is no one talks about it. They know something terrible is happening. They, they hear the rumors. One child in the playground will have seen it and tell all the others. So they need a conversation. So I'm, I, I'm always reluctant to say stop it, ban it, restrict it, and always keen to find ways to um, manage the introduction for children and the uh, inclusion of children in a way that um, recognizes their different needs. I think, for example, refugee children will hear this news more 
uh, painfully, perhaps, than um, children who have a, um, you know, a stable home life. This is a research question, actually. Um, but children will hear this news very differently. And, and that's where um, we need teachers and parents to play careful roles in um, not maximizing their fears, but recognizing their need to understand and their right to know. Euh, bonjour et merci beaucoup euh, pour, euh, pour tout, enfin, d'avoir partagé tout ce travail. Euh, J'étais curieuse de savoir ce que les enfants veulent. Euh, vous avez parlé du workshop que vous avez fait euh, pour euh, leur demander voilà, qu'est-ce qu'ils qu qu veulent et, et ce qu'ils ont écrit euh, à ces grands patrons du numérique. I'm delighted, yes. It's one of the most um, fun parts of my job, but also a serious part. Um, and I'll start by saying I've always been a researcher who um, wanted to go and talk to the people who are affected by the decisions made on high. Um, doing workshops with children, it's um, challenging and it requires a design in its own right, a design of the situation. Often... Um, beginning with something very open. Let's talk about technologies. You have things that your parents didn't have. You know, what do you feel? What do you like? What do you want more? Very general. And then gradually moving into a more kind of focused, um, you know, at some point you have to discuss with them about their rights. They don't always know um, what these might be. Um, sometimes you have to discuss with them what are some of the risks that they haven't thought about and also the opportunities they haven't thought about. So often I do a kind of funneled conversation um, with many games and activities and um, use of post-its and writing on the wall. So um, one of the strongest things they say and this is of any age, is that they really feel they are the generation for whom this technology belongs to them. And they will both, they will live with it in a way that they know their parents and teachers don't, didn't live with. They, and every, every child, I think, can tell you the age at which they first got, played a computer game, the age at which they first got a phone. If they first got a phone when they were 12, They know they were late by comparison with a child who first got a phone when they were nine, or, and they are critical of the one who first got a phone when they were four. Um, you know, they have many views about what is the right way to manage um, uh, this access, but they feel that this, their views really matter. Um, they have always want to talk about how um, their not their values, but their experiences um, put them, um, uh, mean that their parents don't seem to understand. The parent who says, you've played that game for an hour, now you must stop, is the parent who doesn't understand that the game is 45 minutes long, and I can play for 45 minutes and then I can have supper, or I start another one, but if I've started another one, I'm just begun, and all my friends are there, don't tell me to stop. So. It's that sense that, that they understand the, the kind of the language of the digital world and the culture of the digital world. Um, and they don't use the language of strangers or friends because they have a layered social life. Um, I don't know what the word for um, strangers, I mean, they don't say étranger, they would say, in Britain they would say randomers, random people. My parents are worried by, about the randomers, and so am I, actually. But a randomer could become a friend, and could become a, a, a gaming player, and could become, um, uh, but could become scary. And they have many thoughts about this that they think adults don't want to hear because we don't want them to talk to those people in the first place. So we don't want to hear how they would deal with them. But they are talking to each other about um, the weird things that happen on Instagram or the way to keep yourself um, cheerful on TikTok. And they think we don't want to know because we're going to come in and say, stop it, ban it, block it. I hear a lot. Merci. Euh, une question de Dominique. Peut-être Dominique Pasquier est chercheuse aussi en sociologie. Je crois que vous vous connaissez. <laughs> Hello, Sonia. Uh, 
C'est plus facile en français ou en anglais Bon. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is about the Global uh, uh, Kids Online Project. Uh, and how did you pick, choose the, the countries belonging to the project? And uh, in which, which criteria? Because it's uh, quite challenging. There are challenging. 220 <laughs> countries in the world, yes. Yes, and, uh, and the, the second one is uh, about this uh, age-appropriate uh, principle. Uh, it's so difficult to perform this principle with uh, seven social networks, and kids always going where the oldest are not. <laughs> so how do you promote this principle? I think it's so tough. It's, it's so tough. So um, I first want to say hi, Dominique. How wonderful to see you here. Um, um, I think when I began working in European um, networks and research, um, Dominique was France. In my, in my, in my map of the... Um, yeah, these are great questions. So um, when we designed um, EU Kids Online, We had European Commission funding, and it was obvious. We studied the EU 28, as was, um, and, um, and then a few other countries asked to join, and we ended with 33. Global Kids Online, um, we had two problems. First, the number of countries is enormous, and secondly, we had no money. Uh, <laughs> so we changed the model, and we said, okay, we will design the toolkit the uh, survey, the guidance, the ethical um, requirements, the advice on how to consult children, the, the resources. And we will um, work with a few countries that, that there was some money for, one on each continent. And we hope they spread the word. And they began to spread the word, but when I look at the pattern of which, and then the countries had to find their own money and join. And we now have, um, about um, 25 countries on this umbrella and another 20 on a new um, set of funding. Uh, so it's growing, but I think the model is there is a moment in each country's um, history when the public demand becomes so great. The internet has spread so far, so many children have gained access to a device, the risks are hitting the headlines, Um, the schools are beginning to embed the technology and then there is a need for evidence. Uh, and at that point, um, a researcher or a UNICEF country office or a policy maker will come to us and say, we would like to join this project and we will find the funding. And then they join. And so this is, so I think it's meaningful, the order. So um, in um, Latin America, we have lots of interest. And I think that is something about how embedded the internet has been without an adequate evidence base to guide people. Um, UNICEF has now found money for um, uh, poorer countries in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think this is really brilliant, but it's very much led by an anxiety about risk and protection and less so about opportunities and education, which is a problem. Um, but I, I, I think, um, so, it, it, it kind of evolves. Um, back to the European Commission's model of an age-appropriate design code, I think it's a fascinating challenge. So it began, um, in fact, with um, um, work in Britain um, through the Five Rights Foundation and our Data Protection Authority, who um, developed the idea of age-appropriate design to um, take a step back from the worries of protection and the um, optimism of um, uh, um, opportunities and to say, let's focus on the design and let's focus on the data. And so it's, it's come not through child protection, but through data protection. And so it's a very interesting move to say that through controlling the data and the uses that companies make of the data, we can in fact deliver protection, safety, and opportunities for children. And that's the, so that's a new approach. The, Commission, the European Commission for a long time has its Better Internet for Kids program, which began as safety and is now safety 
plus education. Um, but this is a new move, but it depends on something. It depends on knowing who is a child. It depends on knowing where the data came from. We're now facing artificial intelligence and anyone using artificial intelligence and a large language model. The data that scrapes the, the data is scraped from everywhere. You don't know if it's from a child, you don't know if it's, you know, anything. But you run your artificial intelligence, you make it a plug-in in your um, school uh, technology suite, um, and you don't know where the data comes from or where it goes. So these are, you know, so it's, it's an effort to kind of get a grip on some of these exploitative features, but also because they affect children's rights. Um, I don't know, I think it's going to be um, a really interesting one to watch. You should get involved, get on the committee. <laughs> On, on peut se demander, euh, on peut se demander si un travail de labellisation générale, vous voyez, une manière de reconnaître sur les différents services en ligne via un label, une marque, un, une étiquette, euh, euh, quelque chose qui serait, qui serait produit dans le respect des droits de l'enfant. Mais, mais ça vient poser la question de l'ethics by design. Au-delà de la question des enfants, est-ce qu'on ne doit pas aujourd'hui trouver une solution pour dire ce service, il est OK, il a été produit dans des conditions euh, responsables Yes, and we know. In fact, I think we are in a position to say that almost no digital products and services um, meet these requirements. Um, and this is so our starting point is a low one, and we need to raise the bar. Um, a child rights lens. Um, poses us some challenges. So one thing any um, human rights uh, lawyer will say is that human rights, children's rights, um, cannot be ranked. They are interconnected, indivisible, and you can't say, well, I'll deal with privacy, but I'm going to forget safety. Or I want this to be um, a, a source of information, and I'll get to privacy later. And I have to say, in interviewing um, developers and designers, I heard that a lot. Um, I'm developing a new social media app for eight-year-olds because they're too young for Instagram. I've got a way of connecting and they can share, the, upload their photos and so on. I say, how do you know that a stranger won't do it? They say, well, look, I want to get into the app store first and then I'll come to safety. And I say, no, 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 everything at once. And they say, but I don't have the budget for everything at once. I have to show proof of concept. I don't get the investment unless I have. And, then, and, and so I say, well, you, can't, you cannot go on the market without making sure strangers cannot contact the child. Then I say, and what are you doing with the data? Oh, they say, I don't know. It goes into the Amazon cloud services. I haven't, I'll look into that later. No, I say, you have to look at that now as well because you can't say that you're an app to give children contact with their friends and then monetize their data in ways that are... So it's really hard. I think it is a real challenge and maybe a child rights bar is very high. I hope it's a nice phrase, child rights by design. Um, I hope it's a kind of, a ins I've tried to make it colorful and um, we, we hope it's inspiring. And it's meant to be an answer to the many, I, I get um, an, uh, an approach every, every few days. I'm developing this. I'm not sure if my product is okay. Could you take a look at my um, EdTech app for learning mathematics and tell me if it, so I think there is a real demand We could say the government should pass a law. You don't go onto the market until you have done this. We don't um, put food on the market until we've made sure it has no poison, it has a nutrition label, it's, it is precisely what it says it's going to be, and if anything goes wrong, they're going to um, give you an insurance payout, right? We don't put the food, we don't put the car on the road until it's gone through all of its checks to make sure it's roadworthy. We put the app into the app store and onto children's phones, saying we'll get to all of that later. I mean, it is quite extraordinary, really, that we are saying this is an area of experimentation and innovation. So maybe the French government will be the one to 
<laughs> make the um, digital service like the um, car or the baby food? Um, that's an interesting perspective because that leads to the idea that um, the digital world is a global world and that the way we can address it is through local policies and local investments um, not telling what local means. I mean, in France, we have the privacy by design, the accessible, I don't know, for uh, disabled people by design, and so on. And this, the, what I found interesting in your slides was that um, on uh, the menaces that um, kids were confronted to, there were some local specificities. And that makes it very difficult for everybody to consider this um, global thing of the world is uh, in reach of our hands and it's a great opportunity for kids to be able to speak with an Asian and American and so on. But we need to address this, I mean, uh, on, a, on a local way. What's your regard toward this? Um, great question. It, it's... Um there are so many answers, and um, people are discussing exactly this. So, some things are um, near global, let's say, the power of um, Amazon or Meta or Google or Microsoft. They have, let's say, transnational reach. Even so, they mean something different. Um, to a child in, in India, uh, for a long time, Facebook has been the internet because it was the way of accessing. Um, to um, a child in, um, I, I hear from, let's say, a child in Nigeria, um, uh, Google uh, does not speak their language. You know, we say read the terms and make the terms and conditions child friendly, get the advice, you know, but um, Google doesn't translate its service into most of the languages of the world, so most children can't understand even when there is advice or guidance or um, um, support. Uh, so even the big transnational companies are culturally and um, geographically different. Um, on the other hand, um, some of the risks are transnational. So some of the um, risks of child trafficking managed online or child abuse managed online are transnational crimes people here, people there, children somewhere else. Um, and it needs that international, that global um, action from Interpol, let's say, or um, the United Nations, um, various bodies. Other things people feel very strongly are national. So what should be the role of parents, for example, in um, managing and children's access? Um, people feel is very culturally specific. Actually, the um, UN Committee on the Rights of the Child just made a new statement on the role of parents and where cultural variation is um, acceptable and where it is not. Uh, and it's, it's a, a beautifully written, quite finely judged document, as you can um, imagine. Um, so every country apart from the US in ratifying the convention has made that commitment to the world that it will um, enact the and realize the convention rights and that's the starting point but you know what is education what do we mean by play um, these things are hugely different and um, probably rightly so Merci beaucoup pour euh, votre présentation très éclairante. J'avais une question qui est un petit peu en pas de côté, mais je pense euh, euh, quand même très dans le thème. C'est la question du consentement des enfants. Euh, vous avez parlé dans, dans votre présentation de l'exposition le, à des contenus pornographiques, violents, haineux, etc. Euh, et très souvent, les enfants se retrouvent confrontés à ces images-là par un tiers, euh, qui peut être un algorithme, euh, mais parfois, ça peut être par leurs propres parents quand leur euh, image, leur identité est mise euh, sur Internet, sur Instagram, que sais-je. Et euh, on sait aujourd'hui que ces images-là, qui sont, qui sont mises sur les réseaux sociaux, euh, se retrouvent très souvent 
dans des euh, plateformes euh, pédocriminelles euh, et est-ce qu'on ne va pas se retrouver à un moment euh, plus tard quand ces enfants font, auront grandi à un espèce de Far West euh, judiciaire euh, dans le sens où ces enfants vont vivre déjà un préjudice en, en tant qu'enfants risqueront de le vivre en tant qu'adultes puisque on sait que c'est quasiment impossible de retirer des contenus euh, pornographiques ou pé pédopornographiques euh, d'Internet. Et en fait, je me demande euh, qu'est-ce qu'on a aujourd'hui comme levier pour les protéger en tant qu'enfants et qu'auront-ils en tant qu'adultes pour ben, en fait, voilà, euh, réparer la situation ou du moins euh, voilà, euh, corriger ce préjudice-là qu'ils auront pu euh, vivre en fait Autant au regard de leurs parents qu'au regard de la société et de leur future vie de, dans la société. I think um, this is one of those areas where the regulation and the technology is always behind um, the practice. And there are two practices which rush ahead of all of us. One is parents' delight in photographing every second of their child's life and posting it online. And the other is the um, um, Uh, exploitative um, and um, motivated capacity of bad actors, including paedophiles, um, to find this content and now manipulate it and misuse it. Um, and so, the, so, but there is right now in, in Europe a, a very lively debate about um, a, a regulation on addressing particularly the sexual exploitation and abuse of children um, online. And It's a fight. I don't know if people are following that fight. It's, a, it's one of the most polarized fights. And the problem is that it is, to, is, this, is the apparent conflict between safety and privacy. So in order to protect children's images, we need some mechanism and some legitimate mechanism of tracking all images, checking all images. Every WhatsApp message you send to your friend or... So, the, the, so I think we have done reasonably well in the last five years in developing technologies which can identify illegal content and which can remove known illegal content from the public internet. No one is doing well with the dark web, um, where um, the extent of the crime overwhelms law enforcement in any country. But people are doing better. We've been doing quite well in the public internet. And I don't know if you remember the early days of, um, um, some people here might remember the early day days when I went to work and there was pornography in my work email just being sent to me. Or, I mean, many things have been sorted out over time without a huge um, controversy. But now the regulation before the Commission is to have technical monitoring of all content to identify illegal content. And to some people, this is the solution. And to the other side, this is the surveillance state gone completely crazy. And um, I think there are now, they're now looking for some solution which will be not really satisfy either side, but perhaps take children's safety one step forward, possibly take everyone's privacy one step back. And uh, maybe that's where the idea of best interests come in, that one tries to find some kind of halfway compromise. Um, but it is remarkably difficult. And artificial intelligence is making it much worse. And again, much faster. I mean, the um, European Union's AI Act is also kind of nearly there, but... Um, whether it will deal with this in practice, whether it will be enforced in practice, whether the regulators are strong enough to make Meta and Amazon and so on comply is still unclear. Bonjour, moi j'avais une question à vous poser sur le soin qu'on donne aussi à la parole qui est donnée par les enfants. Tout à l'heure, vous avez, pré vous avez pré précisé que euh, euh, certains livraient des formes d'expérience qui parfois pouvaient heurter voilà, ce que pensaient leurs parents, donc ils se confient. 
Et donc, quand vous êtes dans ce processus de collecte de cette parole, donc pour revenir aussi sur ce qui a été dit tout à l'heure sur le consentement, quand on s'entretient avec des enfants, il y a un certain nombre d'éléments de, voilà, de, 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 qu'on doit mettre en place. Donc, le consentement pour, les enfants, enfin pour les, les enfants qui sont mineurs, le consentement des parents ou des personnes qui sont leurs tuteurs et leurs tutrices. Et est-ce que, voilà, comment on, 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 on joue sur ce, voilà, ce gap Peut-être que certains enfants, je ne sais pas, dans des classes, veulent livrer des formes d'expérience et puis les parents s'y opposent. Donc, comment on travaille ce, voilà, ce que les enfants veulent dire et ce qu'ils peuvent dire si jamais on ne leur donne pas l'autorisation Et ma deuxième, je ne sais pas si c'est clair, ma deuxième question, c'est dans ce recueil. Est-ce que, du coup, vous avez été confronté dans vos terrains à des expériences qui avaient été livrées, des récits livrés par des enfants et qui, finalement, heurtaient tellement ce que pensaient leurs parents que les parents, a posteriori, vous disaient... Bah, Là, il y a un problème. Je ne souhaite pas, par exemple, que cette parole soit livrée ou pas. Donc, comment on, on joue cette, cette question du, sur cette question du consentement et du soin et de la, la hiérarchie, en quelque sorte, qu'on donne euh, a posteriori quand on doit livrer des résultats de recherche entre la parole des enfants et ce que sont prêts à euh, céder ou pas les, les, les personnes qui les accompagnent Researchers love questions like this about uh, methodology and ethics because we spend a lot of time worrying about exactly this. So thank you for the question. Um, so we have um, every institution, my institution, my university has the rules. We also have um, the um, various forms of guidance uh, and so forth. Um, so one rule is that I never tell a parent what a child has said in an interview, ever. Um, and I, um, and I, nor do I tell a child what their parent has said. Um, I promise them confidentiality. I promise them conditional confidentiality. So if a child ever tells me, and I promise up front in the consent form, I will keep everything you say um, confidential and anonymous unless I have reason to believe that you are in present danger. And if I believe you're in present danger, then I take action. And it may not be by telling the parent, because the parent may be the danger. So I don't, that's a complicated decision. Um, but some countries, I don't know about France, some countries have mandatory reporting. If you hear a child is in risk, you're legally obliged to tell the authorities. Some countries, it's um, a matter of ethics and choice. And other countries have nothing, but it's still a matter of ethics, of course. Um, so I would get, so I always get consent from the parent, consent from the child. So the question is, what are they consented to? So I tell them about the project. I try to convince the parent that it is important that their child's views are heard, that this is a project which is going to be listened to. Um, I will send the results to people who can make, change the policy. It matters. I say this to the children as well. They need to know that their voice matters. And I'm not just listening for myself, but I'm listening to do something with their voice. And I um, would say I have very rarely had a parent say, no, my child can't participate. But of course, I do have the parent and child who just doesn't come, doesn't turn up on the day. Um, and then I, th there is really nothing. You know, we, we do our best. We try to be inclusive. We try to be, we th think carefully about where we will meet, how we will meet, um, how the project is introduced and framed, what is offered, um, uh, uh, but there are limits. Um, and so there are probably always voices who are not heard. But if I think about the, um, for the general comment 25, we did a stakeholder consultation with children and we worked with the organizations who work with children with disabilities and the organizations who work with children who are refugees and migrants and the organizations who work with children um, who don't have any parents. And so, we, so there are um, trusted intermediaries, if you like, who can really help us um, reach the children who otherwise it might be hard. Thank you. Hello. Um, au départ, vous parliez de la problématique entre euh, donc l'utilisation qui est faite de, de l'idée de protection des enfants sur Internet pour euh, du coup de la surveillance de masse et ces problématiques-là. Et euh, justement, s'il y a bien quelque chose qui a soulevé cette problématique qui vient juste d'arriver, c'est le DSA, le Digital Service Act, 
Et en fait, c'est simplement ça ma question. Je voulais savoir si vous aviez une opinion en fait, sur le DSA qui, justement, va aussi beaucoup protéger les enfants par, euh, par exemple, l'interdiction totale des, euh, de, des, euh, des contenus ciblés pour les, enfants, pour les mineurs, par exemple. Donc, je voulais savoir si vous aviez une opinion sur ce sujet-là. Merci. Merci. Um, well, I think the short answer, thank you, is that we wait to see how the um, uh, Digital Services Act will be implemented. Um, but it's a fantastically promising move. So, um, so if we think, okay, it's, it's the first pan-European um, act. It is risk-based, so it requires providers to do a risk assessment. Could their service be a risk to children? Um, and then it requires them to take a number of, me of um, measures designed for um, child safety, child well-being, child privacy. Uh, and it um, appoints, uh, uh, should be, a powerful, um, uh, responsible body to oversee the implementation. Um, and I think it includes remedy as well, because often children are left out of the question of remedy. If something does go wrong, it is take the case of the general data protection regulation, it is very hard for a child to ask Meta, where is my data and what have you done with it? You know, we, we need, um, they need um, measures to, to improve this. So I, th I think I'm optimistic. I mean, I would say of the DSA, it's, um, it's risk-based and therefore it's focused on um, the eliminating the negatives. So it doesn't, in its own, help children explore, express themselves, access the information that is their right, um, be uh, Greta Thunberg and, you know, go and protest, as is also their right. Um, but it does um, promise to remove the barriers that make that unsafe. And, and if you um, see, talk to or see the research on children who are um, human rights defenders or child rights um, activists themselves, then they have to deal with a huge amount of hate and bullying and um, uh, hostility online. So anything that deals with that will enable children's rights. Um, we hope it will be. I don't know. What, can I pass the question back? Are you optimistic that it will um, make Europe a better place? Uh, I think I am. But Some of my friends and people that I meet are quite nervous about the, the censorship, but for my part, I'm optimistic. <laughs> Une question de Jennifer. Tiens. Thank you very much for your uh, for, for all of this done and the, uh, all of this um, time with us. Um, we consider since the beginning of the. Um, of your uh, exposure, we are considering only uh, legal and um, regular businesses. <laughs> and we should consider irregular businesses because it's not a, a little question with the children. Uh, for example, today we are Friday and we know that the kids are going to receive uh, invitation to buy uh, illegal stuff on their phones. So um, education it, it's not at the end. And uh, are you considering this on your studies? Ill illegal stuff, yes. Um, yes, so I'm wondering now what, um, okay, what um, illegal... So I think the key question, uh, I'll go back to the children in the real world and their kind of holistic... Um, Uh, how much, um, okay, let's say that children in school are being um, offered a way to buy drugs on, online, let's say. Um, is this a matter for um, the DSA to say this is an online risk? Or for the local police station to say this is a crime happening here in this school? Um, or for um, national law enforcement to um, have a crackdown on the local drug dealers. Um, you know, these are distributed responsibilities. And I think the really hard question is to acknowledge all of these problems and then work out which are the best agencies um, to take action. And um, especially the challenge I hear in every country is how to get those agencies to coordinate. So they don't sit and say, 
that's their problem. They've got to deal with it. But you know that it is being dealt with because there is coordination. And um, I guess that should be or could be the children's ombudsman. Is there a children's ombudsman here? I think there is a children's ombudsman. Anyway, there should be some mechanism. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Um, and I'll just link back to the worry about censorship. So I think if we, whenever we look for um, uh, regulatory or policy solutions that operate through laws on the digital, then there is this concern that there, it's a clumsy tool and it is overly restrictive of especially adults' right to access all kinds of content, perhaps not offers of illegal drugs. Um, but the tools can be... Um, um, uh, the, the, the measures can seem too crude, and, a lot of, and there's a lot of worry that companies will be very conservative. So they will just... Um, there will be a chilling effect. Is chilling effect good in French? Um, they, will, they will step back from doing many things that they should do or could do because they fear um, the regulation. So I think, you know, at some point we say this is for the police rather than... But, of course, the companies mediate and amplify and extend um, the um, illegal activity at a scale that the police have never had to deal with before. And that is a challenge. I'm hoping that you guys have solutions as well as problems. Merci beaucoup. C'est la fin de cette intervention. C'est important qu'on arrive à finir à l'heure. Merci beaucoup, Sonia. L'ensemble des ressources sont téléchargeables. Elles sont en anglais pour l'instant. Peut-être un jour en français. Mais merci encore. Merci à tous. 